Hello, everybody, and welcome today to today's webinar. We'll get started here in just one moment. My name is John Mullins, and I'll be your presenter during today's webinar. We'll get started here in just a second. Thank you for everybody for joining today. I know everybody's got a busy week going on, and it's almost to the end of the week, right? So we're going to jump right in here and get started so that you can get on your way and back to what you need to do today, but I appreciate you showing up today. All right, the title of today's webinar, we're going to look at Oracle PL SQL best practices, and this is a part two uh, webinar. Hopefully you were able to attend the part one webinar and found that to be some use to yourself. Uh, but if you weren't able to attend the part one, if you go out to the themasync.com website, um, you can get a copy of the slides there, and there's also a recording of the presentation there as well. So again, if you missed part one, visit themasync.com, and you can uh, review that at your at your leisure. And uh, as many of you know, there's also many other webinars um, out there on that website as well, both Oracle and DB2. There's also some other ones related as well, CICS, Java, uh, Rex. Um, so help yourself out to the web, uh, website. Lots of good recordings and presentations out there that you might find useful. Again, my name is John Mullins, and you can see my email address there on the uh, screen. Everybody should be able to see that. jmullins at themasync.com. So if it, with the short time that we have today, it works best. If you kind of have a question along the way, just kind of jot it down. Send me an email at jmullins at themasync.com, and I'll get back to you there. Uh, a couple other things as we jump in here. Notice the, the website again is on this page here, plus uh, on the website, if you haven't been there recently, um, it's been totally redone. It looks fantastic. It's very easy to move around. has lots of good information out there. So if you haven't been out there lately, make sure you visit that uh, website there. And also, you can also follow us at uh, Themis Training on Twitter as well. I recognize many of the names of people that are joining today, so a lot of you are familiar with with who I am, but in case you're new to the webinar and new to Themis classes, here's just a little bit of information about myself. Um, I started off with back in the 80s, uh, or early to mid 80s on Oracle. Oh, it was Oracle version 5 at the time, 5.122. Um, I've worked at uh, Boeing for 10 years as a developer, DBA, um, and then uh, have worked for various consulting companies and training companies since then. I am an Oracle certified professional DBA and also certified technical trainer. I've taught many different classes over the years from beginning SQL, PL SQL to advanced to tuning to database administration type things. So that's kind of where I'm coming from today. And again, if you have any questions along the way, just uh, shoot them over to my email address. You can see it on this screen as well, jmullins at themasync.com. A little bit more about Themis if you're not familiar with them. They've been around for quite a while and have taught uh, a lot of different classes, lots of different flavors there. You can kind of see them. So if you go out to themasync.com, you can get a list of those courses that we have. And of course, if you don't see something that you need, um, just go ahead and there's some contact information on the website as well that you can get a hold of. Um, and uh, all classes can be customized as well. So that's a good thing. Just get you just you know learn what you need. Um, not a lot of extra fluff thrown in there unless that's the fluff that you need. Now we do have some classes coming up here in the near future that are kind of related to what we're talking about today and also what we talked about last time in the part one. So we have an introduction to PL SQL and advanced PL SQL, and then right off the bat here, not too long down the road, we've got the troubleshooting, debugging, and tuning Oracle PL SQL programs, which is a great class. It's a two-day class um, that'll be offered uh, online, and so uh, feel free to again go out to themasync.com, find the contact information there, and they'll get you all set up. All right, let's jump right in. I know everybody's busy Thursday, though, so that's good. Um, today's part, part two 
And with the part one, we just kind of had miscellaneous best practices. And those best practices were based upon uh, my experience and background. They are also based upon um, some other people who had input into those best practices, whether they be uh, co-workers of mine or people that I've run across to over the years or just information from uh, internet sites or, wet or reference books and such there too. Those are kind of miscellaneous in part one. This time I, I wanted to focus on just the performance and troubleshooting type of best practices. And so that's what we're kind of coming from, from in this case here. So let's take a look at some of those. I've got uh, eight of those for us to take a look at today. Some of these you might be familiar with, some of them maybe not. Um, the purpose of the webinar is to kind of give you some information and you can certainly take back with you, um, check out your environment, see uh, what's going on there, um, see if you're using some of these best practices or not. Um, you may have a, you know, a document that expresses some of these best practices. You may want to add to that. Um, and if you find that, that some of these uh, are not being utilized in your environment, you may want to look into them and see if they might be useful to you or your staff or such. So uh, remember, there's any best practice, any tip, any technique that people talk about, of course, sometimes has to come with an it depends type of uh, qualifier on it as well because everybody's environment's a little bit different, different versions, um, different, some, different amounts of memory available, uh, different way the application's being used. And so you know, we'll, you'll mention that as we go through these here today. And uh, thanks again. Let's jump right in. All right, remember these are trying to get these related to troubleshooting, debugging, uh, performance related best practices. And uh, the first one here I've always found to be really useful. Um, and if we're, if we're trying to narrow down to a piece of, to a line of code that's causing a performance issue. Um, so there's a PL SQL pro profiler available to us and I've always found it to be very useful. Um, the profiler is really easy to use. You'll see a couple slides here coming up on kind of some of the output that it will produce for us. Um, but it's basically going to go out there, you're going to start the profiler and you're going to run some code and then you're going to stop the profiler and then you're going to examine what the profiler uh, gathered along the way there. And you can see some of the information that it might give you. As far as the, the, the things, the programs that were running, the PL SQL programs that were running, um, the number of times each line in a particular program was executed. Um, you can see, you know, this is kind of like the AWR report. Um, some of you are familiar with that, the Automatic Workload Repository, as related to, say, SQL and PL SQL. You'll see a, a little section in that AWR report that will show you code that was running between two time frames there. And it will tell you how, how many times that code was executed and how much time it took. This is kind of a similar thing, but here we're getting down to the, just maybe specifically to a certain, say, store procedure or function that we're trying to look at. You know, the second sub-bullet down there, the total amount of time that has been spent executing that line. And I've got a real good example, some output coming up here that, uh, that demonstrates that. Okay. All right, the, the PL SQL profiler, it's one of the ways that it can be utilized is through a package called dbms underscore profiler. In that package, there's, there's some programs in there, obviously, but there are two in particular, the start profiler and the stop profiler. And remember, we're going to, I'll show you the steps here in a second. I've already mentioned them once, but we start the profiler, execute the, say, store procedure or whatever, and then stop the profiler. And the purpose of doing that is to identify, you know, here's the example. I've got my store procedure took two hours to run. Okay, and my store procedure might be, you know, 5,000 lines of code. Okay, where within that 5,000 lines of code was that two hours spent? It was it spent on mostly on a single line of code? Was it spread across multiple lines of code? Where was the time spent? Because if, if two hours is not acceptable for various reasons, I, I need to narrow down where the problem is so I can start working on it. Is a particular SQL statement? Um, where is it in the program? So it, the, the profiler is going to help me identify these, these hot spots. 
and then give me a point from there to proceed and tune those hotspots. If it's SQL, I might run it through the explain plane utility. Um, I may check on indexes and statistics, whatever it might be. Um, the normal things I would do in tuning, say, an SQL program. All right, here's those steps I was talking about. So we start the profiler, we execute the code, we stop the profiler, and then we look at the profiler data. Now, the profiler data is available to us through some uh, data dictionary views. Okay, and I'll show you one of those on here on the next uh, page coming up. But there's two or three really good data dictionary views that we can query and see information about. Okay, here's a profiling session. It was started on this date, on this time. It ended on this date and this time. And this is the amount of time that it took to run. And then from there, that's kind of at a high level. And then I can dig down and look at it at a lower level based on the different programs that it may have been running during that time frame. So once I run that, and like I said, it's very simple to do, run the start profiler procedure, run your code, run the stop profiler procedure, and then we can look at the output, which here's a good example of that. Should have just popped up on your screen there. Uh, this is coming from the PLSQL underscore profiler underscore data view. Uh, and this is just a picture, part of that data that's coming back from that view in this place here. So this is coming back from a particular store procedure. You can see in the store procedure, it's not necessarily good code. It's this procedure was kind of meant to demonstrate the power of the profiler here. So it's not necessarily the best code in the world. But you can see down in there, I've got some for loops. Um, the first one up there is just uh, inserting some data into a table, 1 through 50,000. The second one down there, however, inside uh, the for loop there, um, we've got some updates and deletes. And it doesn't show you everything that's in there. So you may notice there might be some errors in that code down there. For example, I don't see any end loops down there at this point. But we just want to look at the, in particular, the lines that show up there. All right. So if we look over there on the uh, right side uh, there, we can see the total occurrences, how many times each particular line of code was executed. And then the big thing that we can see there, there's the total time. So we can see that in this case, for this particular program, the, the update statement that uh, was executed within that second for loop there it was executed 50,000 times, and it took, in this case, 57 seconds. Okay, Not necessarily a big amount of time, but you can see compared to the rest of the, the timings of the lines in code that are, that are being returned by this particular view, that is a significant percentage of the total time that the procedure took to run in this case. And it tells you then uh, the, lines of, the line number over on the far right there as far as what it was. So I, my update took up the most amount of time. The delete took up a considerable amount of time as well. Although you can see the insert didn't take up hardly any time at all. And then if there are other things in this program, they would show that as well. So remember, in this case here, I'd say, OK, the majority of time was spent on the update statement. And now I can look at that and see how I can improve on that, whether I should convert this program to do you know, bulk processing with the for all statement, maybe instead, that's probably might be a good idea, right? We're going to take a look at that uh, type of thing, the bulk processing at the end of the presentation here. But you can see from this particular slide, it's pretty obvious where the hotspot is. And like I said, this is very simple to set up. So um, keep the, the PLSQL profiler in mind as one of your best practices. Remember, it's supposed to help us identify the lines of code that are consuming the most amount of time, the, the most occurrences in an overall time frame. So I, I always find this to be very helpful. All right, let's take a look at another one here. Um, this has to do with our PLSQL programs and compiling them. There's a parameter called PLSQL underscore optimize underscore level. And if you're not familiar with that parameter, you may want to want to kind of look it up. Um, because when we compile our program, depending on the setting for that parameter, the compiled version of the program may not be what we expect. Okay? This particular, notice that second bullet up there. It can rearrange code. 
Okay, so it can do things like um, if your program calls other programs, it could bring the code from the other programs into this main program. In other words, make it in line with the main program there. It can also change, um, for example, um, I'm doing an explicit cursor, maybe with a for loop, and I'm processing record by record, which isn't always the best performance uh, type of code. It can also change that to, depending on this parameter setting, to a bulk collect in the compiled version. Okay, we'll talk a little bit more about that here in just a moment. So we want to be aware. So if you're not aware of what this parameter setting is and you're a PLSQL program, um, either look up the, the parameter setting yourself if you have the privileges to do that. You, you can do a select from a view called V dollar sign parameter. Or if you're an SQL plus, you can do show parameter and put in the parameter name. If you don't have the privileges to do that, find your DBA and ask them what this parameter setting is. Okay, no harm on that. Here's what the values can be for that particular parameter setting. Okay, valid values are 0 to 3. 0 basically says when I compile my PLSQL program, I'm not, nothing's really going to happen. Okay, that kind of almost like it disables it or turns it off. It, there may be a few minor things, but nothing to speak of there. If we set it to 1, it's basically going to remove any unnecessary, un unnecessary uh, computations. Okay, so sometimes we, you know, we take another piece of code and, and use that as a template for our new piece of code. There may be pieces of code that we forget to take out or we put pieces of code in there that really aren't buying us anything. Um, if it's set to a value of one, he's going to try. Oracle's going to the compiler is going to try to recognize that and uh, take those lines. Out, those lines of code won't appear in the compiled version of it. Now, with a setting of one, he's not going to reorder any code. Sometimes we can get a benefit by reordering code. Here's a line of code down here at line 35. Where it's at there is not very efficient. Um, it's executing more times than it needs to, and they may move it outside of the loop or something like that. With a setting of 1, it will not reorder the code. Now, the default value is a 2, and it will do quite a bit of things with just the 2 there. One of the things is, with a setting of 2, it will take those for loops that I just mentioned on the previous slide that are looping through an explicit cursor, and will convert those to a bulk collect with a limit of 100. So to go out there, get, a, get 100 records from the cursor, if, that's, if those are available, basically store those internally in array type structures and process those. Now that's very important because notice the default is 2 and the level that it needs to be set to is 2 in order for it to transform for loops that are processing a record at a time into a bulk collect. And the re reason I mentioned that's important because later on in this presentation we'll talk about bulk collects. And if you've been in any of the other PLSQL webinars and classes that we have, we talk about bulk collects and we usually see some really good performance gains by doing them um, within reason. Um, but let's say you have a program now that's not performing very well. And you notice in your program you have, hey, we talked about that. We have an explicit cursor. It's in a for loop. It's processing one record at a time through the cursor. Everybody keeps telling me that if I convert that one record at a time to a bulk collect, I'll see better performance. Well, then you convert it to the bulk collect and you run it, and it's basically the same performance. Reason being was this parameter was already set to a 2 and was already had converted your code to a bulk collect. And so you don't see the difference in performance there. Now, the difference you might get there for performance reasons is, remember that the default of 2 will convert those for loops to a bulk collect with a limit of 100. So if you want to explicitly convert it yourself to a different limit, like 1,000 or 10,000, which might give you even better performance depending on what your records look like, the length of those records, and how much memory is being used there, you may still see an increase there, but if you just leave it as a 2 and you convert it 
and you don't change it, I mean, anything from a 100 or something similar, you may not see an increase in performance. So it's very important to know the setting for this parameter. Okay, and this parameter, by the way, can be set at both the session level and the system level. So if you want to be, if you want to be testing some performance just within your own environment, do an alter session command, change this parameter to whatever. For example, we haven't talked about the, if we set it to a three, what happens? Well, you get everything from the two and the one, but if you set it to three and your program calls other programs and such, he'll try to bring those programs in line to the main program for the compiled version. So rather than having to exit the program and such, the, pro the code will be brought in, li in line. Now you can do your, your program, you can specify that your, your called programs be made in line manually yourself through a pragma. Okay, so some of you or all of you might be familiar with what a pragma is. And a pragma is just a directive to the compiler. So there is a, a pragma called inline, and you can use that if you want your programs to be brought in line with the main program. You do get a performance gain by that, depending on how many times those other programs are actually called. So if I'm calling a program within a loop, a function within the loop, or a store procedure within the loop, I could see some better performance there if I brought that called program in line. If I set this parameter to three, Oracle is going to try to do that automatically for me, and I won't have to do the, the pragma. If I leave it at two, and I still want things to be brought in line, then I have to do, a, do that with a pragma. And we're going to see that with our best practice number five today. So I don't want to go through all of that um, at this point. But just remember this parameter. Check it out. See what the setting is. So you know what the behavior of your program is going to be. Is your program actually being rewritten or not? All right, our number three best practice here as far as within a PL SQL program. Uh, if your PL SQL program, like most PL SQL programs do, if it contains any SQL, tune that first. And you just tune it the normal way you would tune SQL. So um, you guys from uh, previous webinars and previous classes, I know you're getting really good at, at doing this as far as tuning the SQL, running it through explain plain utility. You know, what are we looking for in there? We're looking for... Um, join methods and index methods, which lines of code were executed first, the order of our tables in joins. Um, we're looking for filters and when are those applied? Are those filters applied before joins, after joins? When do they show up there? Um, we, we'll check to see if, if full table scans and why did the optimizer not choose to do an index. Check on indexes that were available. Maybe they're there. Maybe they're being ignored checking out statistics, all the typical things um, that we would do in tuning SQL. So, uh, for example, here's your scenario. You have a procedure that runs for an unacceptable amount of time. You're not sure, because it's a large procedure, which line of code is consuming the most if it is narrowed down to one line of co code. Um, you run the what? SQL, the PL SQL profiler, like we talked about earlier. Find the lines of code that you need to be really looking at there. And if some of those lines of code are SQL statements, then you proceed to this step here and try to tune those SQL statements individually first. Okay. Number four, um, the result cache. Um, we've seen the result cache in other webinars and in class as well. So we know that with the result cache, if we, if we decide to utilize that, Oracle is going to store results of our queries in memory in something called the result cache, which is an area of memory that resides in the shared pool for those DBAs out there, um, or for those of you that have been in some of the, even the developer classes we have, we try to get everybody on the same page. Um, and then the next time that query is executed, depending on some criteria, which I'll go through here in just a second, the, if I run this query to get a certain, say, average of something, it can read the result that's stored in the result cache rather than going to the raw data and recomputing the average again. So if I had to read through 10 million records to compute an average, 
if I use the result cache, the, that average is stored in the result cache, and the next time the query is run, he can read the, let's say it's one record out of the result cache instead of the 10 million, and I can get a performance gain there. These are very similar, if you haven't seen this before, very similar to materialized views, except that there's no physical structure involved here. Now, the, the things that throw this off are a couple. One is um, the data that went into the average. Has it changed since the last time the average was calculated? If it has, then the average that's stored in the result cache is marked as invalid. Your query will still run, but it will run against the raw data, which means it would read the 10 million records. So this isn't a feature that's really good for data that's changing boom, boom, boom all the time, very frequently. Um, but you also have to ask, even if it is changing fairly frequently, how often is your the query that you're running running within that time frame? So uh, let's say it changes, the data changes, you know, every three or four minutes. And some people would say, oh, that's off the chart um, for this particular query. I'm not going to see any performance gains there. But we have to ask a second question. Within that three or four min minutes that it doesn't change, how often is that particular query executed? What if it's executed 100 times or 500 times, which could take advantage of the result cache until it gets marked invalid at that fourth minute or so? So we need to ask both of those. But the purpose of it is, is to reduce the number of reads, whether they be physical or logical from memory, in order to produce the result. Now, in this case here, we're talking about PL SQL only, but you can do it in SQL through, say, a hint. There is a result cache hint. But here's an example popping up on your screen here of a, of a PL SQL function. So functions in PL SQL can be what's called result cache enabled. And you can see here I have an arrow pointing to the, the, the option there. So if we do our create or replace function, we tell it what kind of data type we're going to return. Um, then before our declare section here, if we just say result cache, that's going to make this function result cache enabled. So I don't have to use the hints, for example. So the first time I run this function, which is we're going to pass in a department number and it's going to calculate the average salary and pass back that average salary. The first time it's going to read the raw data and then store it in the result cache and then give you the result. The next time this function's called with the same department number as input to it, it's going to look in the result cache to see if the data is there, if it's still valid, and if it is, boom, here's your result, and I don't have to recalculate it. Okay? If the data has been marked invalid because it's changed since the last time the function is run, then at that point uh, I'll just read the raw data again, put the result back in the result cache, and it's good for the next time. Okay. This In this case here, since this function has input parameters to it, in this case that's the department number, if someone runs it for department 10, and the result cache will be the average for department 10. If somebody else runs it for department 20, then there'll be a result in the result cache for department 20. So it's going to be based upon the, the input into it. And there's, there's uh, programs, um, there's a package that goes along with the result, result cache that allows you to look into the result cache and see what's there. See, see how much space is being used, see what objects are in there like tables or such, see what programs are in there like function in this case, um, and that's very easy to do. So kind of, kind of consider the result cache kind of like a, a memory only materialized view, but you don't, the big thing here is you don't really have control over the refresh rate because it's going to be refreshed or marked invalid whenever the underlying data changes. So, you know, Oracle always comes up with these features that are, that are maybe good for one environment but not good for another environment. You know, for instance, they'll say, hey, this, fe this feature is ideal for a data warehouse environment where the data doesn't change very often. Maybe it's refreshed incrementally nightly. Maybe it's once a week. Maybe it's you know, a hybrid, and it's ch it's changed more often, but it's still not real time. Every you know sub second being changed there. So, um, for those this is good for those queries that read a lot of data to produce much smaller result sets. Okay, so 
And that's typically kind of the, the function of a function, if we want to say something like that. But again, remember, you can also do this with just plain SQL as well. All right, we mentioned this subprogram inlining earlier, but here it comes again because this is the kind of the manual method of it. So earlier we mentioned this PLSQL optimized level parameter. If we set it to three, we can get this inlining by default, basically, based on the parameter setting. If we leave that parameter, the PLSQL optimized level, at a setting of two, which is the default, then we have to override that and use the pragma uh, inline to uh, tell the optimizer, direct the, the, direct the compiler, I should say, um, to consider using inlining. If our program, and the, remember the, uh, the benefit here is if you have a program that calls other programs so that he can bring those, actually other programs code and bring it in line with the calling program and so I don't have to, really, I don't have to leave the program in order to execute the code. And so a best practice is for those programs that have lots of calls in them to consider using the inlining or changing the parameter setting to a three. Um, this is just a small one here on this next one, uh, number six. You know, as we, as we have variables that we need to declare, um, they might be numeric in, in nature. Are we going to have a variable that, that whose data type is number, explicitly number, maybe with some precision and some scale, or do we want to give it um, a different data type such as PLS integer or simple integer or something like that. Um, for in your program, if you're doing computation type things like um, this variable equals some variable and then here's a calculation, blah, 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 out to there, maybe it's, it's done many times, say within a loop type of thing. Um, having a variable declared as a PLS integer can give you better performance than say just a number, just based on the way those data types have been derived internally within Oracle. Now, related to that, here's another parameter setting that you may want to check and it can make some difference on whether or not how these data types are used. So there is a parameter called PLS uh, PLSQL underscore code underscore type, it can have different settings of interpretive or native that will kind of dictate, did you explicitly declare the data type to be a number? Did you explicitly uh, declare it to be a PLS integer? Or is it just a number and then based on the data, t the setting for the parameter, is that thing going to behave a little bit differently? And so those can make some difference. So you may want to look into this one if you have, notice there are computations. If, this, if I'm just setting a parameter equal to a value and then doing something with it, like comparing it to something else or just printing it in a report or inserting it into a table, I may not see the benefits. But if this is a computation, say, with inside a loop, I may see some performance benefits. So a lot of times we don't, at least not after initial programs have been developed, we don't give a whole lot of thought to, you know, I know this is supposed to be a numeric data type, a lot of people just use number. And they, don't, they know that there's other numeric data types but maybe aren't familiar with what's the difference between number and POS integer or binary integer or simple integer. And so you may want to look at that. And you know, if you do have a PLSQL standards document in your environment, it may address this already for you. So. If you're not aware whether you have a PLSQL standards document, you may want to look into that um, in the near future as well. Now, as everybody knows, within our PLSQL programs, we can pass parameters, um, pass values into our programs or out of our programs or such. Um, there is an option in that parameter. Typically, we see the parameter name, the parameter type, and the parameter's data type. Uh, but we can also add another option to that after we um, define the parameter type, input or output or both. Uh, there's a no copy clause that we can add to that as well. And uh, this all goes into the discussion of passing values um, by reference or are we passing them by value, especially if we have parameters that are, that are their data types are, say, a collection type, an array type or a record type. 
something like that. You know, the larger those values are, they consume more memory, and trying to pass them from one program to another can be a bottleneck. With the no copy, we're just passing it by reference. So it's kind of similar to if you think about some of you are familiar with and use like ref cursors all the time. So you know a cursor is just a pointer to some place in memory where I've got some data. And rather than passing an entire array that contains that data, which might be large, might be millions of records, I may just pass a reference, to, you know, an address to where that array is in memory. And this is kind of the same thing. Um, but we don't have to use it for arrays. We can use the no copy again for, say, record types as well. Okay. Or if we've got other data types that are consuming a lot of area or memory there. So consider a best practice for certain types of data types might be to use the no copy clause on our, in our parameter definitions when we uh, write that code there. Okay, so keep that in mind there. And again, these slides are, are available out at themasync.com. Just go up to the webinar link up there, click on that. Um, you can get a copy of these slides. So if you're taking notes of things to go back and check, um, you can get those from that website there. All right, and the last one here is the context switches. And we've talked about these earlier today, but um, as far as doing the bulk processing is one way to reduce the context switches. You know, a context switch is basically, some, again, some of you might know this already, some of you may not, but if we are in a PLSQL program and it sees an SQL statement within there, the PLSQL engine says, I don't know what that is, and then it passes it over to the SQL engine. And every time I have to do that, that's a performance hit. So. You know, our best practices is to reduce context switches any way as possible. From the very simple things like this, what about select sysdate into some variable from dual? Okay, well, that's an SQL statement. That's a context switch. What if um, instead of doing select sysdate from dual, what if I just do, I have some variable like v underscore date colon equals sysdate? That's an assignment statement. That's a PLSQL statement. No context switch for that. Some people might think, well, sysdate's an SQL function, but the SQL functions within Oracle are compiled a certain way to make them more efficient to where the context switch is not going to be an issue there. Okay. The other extreme context switches that we have are, for example, you're inside a loop, and inside the loop you're doing inserts, updates, or deletes and that loop goes for many times. And so every time it hits that insert, update, or delete, it has to do the context switch. Okay. Just a, a few other things on here. I'll show you some. So let me go ahead a couple of pages here. Um, one more here. Let's go up to this example right here. Sorry, that'll catch up on your screen here in just a second. Here's the actual example of the code here. So if you haven't done these before, so you can do it within you can do it within a cursor, and you can put other, um, and you can see up here that may or may not have a, a within a loop or not. But we're just going to do the bulk like this is the reading part of it. All right, remember that earlier parameter, the PL SQL optimize level parameter. If that's set to a two, then Oracle's already trying to. Um, change your code to use a bulk collect with a limit of 100. Um, if it's only set to a 1 or a 0, it's not, and these would give you some big benefits. All right, if you haven't seen that. So remember, th these require the use of an array. That was one thing it mentioned on one of those slides I passed by there real quick. So when I say bulk collect into this V order IDs and V order totals, those are just arrays that have been, or collections, that have been defined up in my declare section, for example. So rather than going out there and read a record, do something with it, read a record, do something with it, read a record, do something with it, I'm going to go out and read a whole bunch of records in bulk, whatever I tell it to, whether it's a thousand at a time within a loop, whether it's every record in the cursor, now we have to be careful with that, right? You know, these arrays or collections, you know, they take up memory. And if my my cursor from my select, like in this case I'm selecting from the product order table, 
if that's going to, the result of that's going to be millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions, billions of records going into an array, then that could actually hurt me the larger it gets. You know, do I have the memory available for that? These collections or arrays, they're stored in my, in my PGA or the UGA that's out there on the system. So I could exceed the, some limit out there that, that's available to me for that memory, which then causes this to actually, when I convert it to a bulk collect, either to A, run slower, because it doesn't have the total amount of memory to give me at once, it may have to give it to me in pieces, or B, I could just get an error message, you know, if it's large enough that I'm trying to request in that case. But a good best practice is, is to, if, when processing these records, you know, row by row, and I think if you go out there and you read some of the authors that are out there, I think Tom Kite, for one, says row by row is really slow by slow. All right, if within, you know, within reason there. Because if you run these, people say, well, I need to do it one at a time because I need to examine the data as I get it one record at a time. Well, you can still do that with the bulk collect. You're just going to read everything into arrays or collections and then go back through the loop. And then you can examine the data at that point. But at that point, you're examining the data in a, in a collection, which is a PL SQL structure, not an SQL type structure. And so I, I'm avoiding the context switch. So remember, you know, look through your code. If you, if you run it through the profiler, you noticed on that, in that first example that I had at the beginning of the webinar, the update statement was executed 50,000 times. That's going to represent 50,000 context switches. If I can change that update, if we look here at the next slide, say into something like this with the for all statement, um, the for all with the update, this is all one statement, by the way. It's not for all and then an update. Those aren't two statements. So for all can be run with inserts, updates, deletes, and merges. Um, this is all, and if I try to put anything else in there after the for all, I'll get a, an error message there. But in this case here with this update, I'm going from one to um, the array name dot count using that method there to see how many values are in the array. I may have realized that the array was loaded one cell at a time earlier in the program, um, but I may only have one context switch here, depending on what else is on either side of this for all statement. So instead of 50,000, I could reduce it down to one by doing some bulk processing here, if that made sense. And obviously not a trick question on the certification test, which might you consider faster reading executing a doing 50,000 context switches or one context switch one sounds better all the time okay but remember the key part here was if you do have programs like updates within a for loop not a for all but updates within a for loop or you're selecting a record at a time and you think okay it's time for me to finally start using some of this bulk stuff I'm going to try to convert it you may not see that benefit because of that PL SQL optimized level parameter. Because if it's set to two, it's already converting your stuff to bulk collect with a limit of 100. Okay, so keep that in mind when you're thinking about changing your code to some of these best practices or to match uh, some of the items that might be in your PL SQL standards documents that you have at work there. All right, so just wanted to share with you kind of eight best practices, eight separate items that are kind of related to debugging, troubleshooting, or tuning, or performance within PL SQL programs. We talked about the profiler um, and how that can allow us to identify hot spots within our program, what lines of code are consuming the most resources. We talked about parameter settings like PL SQL optimized level. Um, we talked about inline subroutines in there as well, tuning SQL first, um, data types might be best, and a few others that were in there as well. So again, if you want a copy of these slides, just go out to themasync.com and uh, click on webinars, and you can get a copy of the slides. And then 
either in a day or so, the actual recording of the presentation will be out there also. So that you'll be able to get that as well. We do have some upcoming webinars coming up. Um, one's uh, titled Enhance System Period Temporal Tables. It's for DB2. Then we also have an MQ Publish and Subscribe. So next Thursday, April 27th, and then followed by the next Thursday after that, May 4th. And these are listed out there on our website as well. If you want some more information about, you know, training, webinars, anything that, that, that you have interest in there that's related to Oracle, DB2, Java, CICS, whatever, just go out to our website. Um, if, if you want information on training classes, you can contact John Kakaval at jcac at themasync.com. And then, of course, um, on the webinar page, remember all our past webinars are out there as well. So we've done quite a few Oracle ones that have been related to not only PL SQL but to SQL performance um, and things like that as well. So those are all out there. Feel free to go out there and take a look at those in your leisure. Other than that, I thank everybody for coming today. It's Thursday, April 20th, and we're heading into the weekend. So everybody have a good rest of your day and a good rest of your week. Have a good weekend that's coming up. And uh, just check, check out here at themasync.com for future webinars um, related to Oracle, DB2, whatever. Um, and with that, I'll let everybody go for today. Thank you again for attending.